I was just uh, in Philly. We stayed in a very nice hotel. But the, the one, the one problem with the hotel was, I don't think I think the alarm clock in the next room came on like ten to seven, very very loud, and uh, and I don't think anybody was in there. I think somebody left it on because the music just played for a while, but it was okay because it was some songs I liked and. <laughs> And through the wall, after about 10, 15 minutes of, of that, through the wall came John Lennon's Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven above us, all right? No hell below us, all right? Above us, only sky, all right? Imagine, there's no heaven, all right? I want you to fix this. There's no heaven, there's no hell below us, above us, only sky. What does that mean? special edition of Newswatch. I'm Lee Webb. Is Christianity good for the world? For the next 30 minutes, we will be talking with two men who have very different answers to that question. Christopher Hitchens is a journalist who has written for Vanity Fair, The Atlantic, The Nation, and Slate. He's also author of several best-selling books, including God is Not Great. Christopher describes himself not so much as an atheist, but as an anti-theist, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Douglas Wilson is a Christian. He's pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho. He's a senior fellow at New St. Andrews College, and he's the author of several books, including Reforming Marriage and Letter from a Christian Citizen. These men have very different worldviews, but they are not strangers. Christopher and Douglas have collaborated on this book. It's entitled, Is Christianity Good for the World? It is a written exchange on concepts like truth, goodness, and beauty, and we will be addressing some of those concepts in this program. So, gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Let's get started. Well, yeah, well, tell me about the format. For a format, uh, very simple, very informal. Um, I'll start with, uh, I'll give you very brief introductions, uh, turn to Doug and say, hey, tell us in two minutes uh, why Christianity is good for the world. And then two minutes, Chris, you know, why Christianity mm -hmm. is bad for the world. Fair enough. And then I'll let you go back and forth a little bit if you want at that point, again, keep you brief, and then we just go to questions. Town hall format, students asking questions. Uh, hopefully we have, I mean, as you saw last time, we have we have well-mannered people. Certainly. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then we go upstairs and have some lunch. Good. What's for lunch? Uh, I don't know, but man does not live by talk alone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> This is the day the Lord has made. We will, we will rejoice and be glad. Praise God from whom the saints now. Praise Him, our creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Christianity is good for the world because it's objectively true, it's objectively beautiful, and it's objectively good. And you'll notice that I'm following the ancient triad of, of truth, goodness, and beauty. Christians are not rationalists. Christians would point out that rationalists are not rationalists either. Uh, every position is a faith position. I'm impressed with uh, Douglas for this very reason because 
very often when I debate with, with religious Jews and Christians and Muslims, what they're trying to do is say, look, our morality is the same as yours. We all think, we all agree what is and is not moral and ethical. It's just we disagree about where it comes from. He, he understands perfectly well that it's the will of God that's involved. I'm a Christian. Uh, I take it on faith. I believe that faith provides me with a basis for rationality. And I believe that my faith in God and His Word and, and His Christ provides me with a base, a, an objective basis for moral considerations, moral values. Pastor Wilson doesn't, doesn't make it easy on himself in that way. He imposes on himself and on others an unbelievably strenuous burden of worry and guilt. Given that this is a fallen world, and we have to deal with our sinfulness. If you, if you insist on believing that you are depraved, as he would put it, rather than evolved, as I put it, that you labor under a burden of condemnation from your birth, rather than bear the stamp of your lowly origin, as Darwin puts it. People say, look, do you take the, are you a fundamentalist? Do you take the Bible, literally? The answer is no. But I believe it absolutely. This is a collection of 66 books over, written over centuries, uh, many different authors, many different genres, and I believe it's our responsibility to study it, understand what genre a particular book of the Bible is. Is this history? Yes or no. Is this poetry? Yes or no. Is this a prophetic uh, denunciation? Is it an epistolary letter to the Galatians? What, what is it? And then I believe it and accept it that way on its own terms. Whether the argument is celestial, or original, or social, or political, any of these dimensions, uh, it puts him and me, despite our good personal relations, on a side apart, divided from one another, uh, where there's no bridge that can suffice. One of us not, not just has to lose the argument, has to admit a real moral defeat, and I think it should be here. Christopher, let me begin with you. How do you describe, or how would you define truth? How would I define truth? Well, I would know how to define the struggle for it. Uh, I don't believe that, as with the ob objectivity, for example, that it can be declared to have been arrived at or found or discovered. But I think there are rules of etiquette and procedure that one must follow in the unending search so that the struggle may go on. As Rabbi Hillel once put it, uh, you may not uh, ever win the battle, but you are not allowed to give it up. So, uh, would you would you say that there is a basis for truth in the world, for the, the way you described it? Well, I, I don't think that everything is relative. I don't think uh, that subjectivity or individual impressions, in aggregate, cancel each other out. No, I mean I think there are there are there are concepts such as honesty and objectivity that could help one in the struggle for truth. But I would very much doubt someone who said that they'd found what the truth was. I'd be very skeptical of such a claim. Wintry day in August, the snow was falling fast. The barefoot boy with shoes on stood sitting in the grass. Oh, ain't gonna rain no more, ain't gonna rain no more. How the niggas gonna walk the Christopher Hitchens is a public intellectual, which is to say he's the kind of intellectual who matters. He's a man of great abilities, he's quick on his feet. You put it modestly, but it is a fantastically arrogant claim that you make. An incredibly immodest claim, and if made by a fanatic, or by a bully, or by a murderer, I'll take it to the next stage. Isn't it rather the case that with God, anything is permissible? He's uh, witty, smart, and he writes very well. He writes preeminently readable prose. Not everybody who writes for a living can do that. And when someone, uh, when someone is engaging and, and smart, funny, um, they generally get noticed. Are you sure you've got the right guy? <laughs> Thank you. She just said she was a great fan. If I, don't, if I walk several blocks and that doesn't happen, I start to get very sulky. 
<laughs> he's written uh, on Thomas Jefferson. He's written about George Orwell. Uh, and most recently, recently his uh, book on atheism, God is Not Great. With letters to the editor or emails, it's exactly the reverse. It's like 60, 40 against or 70, 30 against. Anyone will tell you. So it means that a lot of people are recognizing me and thinking there's that asshole. <laughs> That scumbag, and not saying anything. And Christopher represents an alien worldview to mine. He thinks Jesus Christ was a real person, was the Son of God, was crucified, dead and buried, suffered under conscious pilot, and rose again from the dead. So I know where I am with him. He is an atheist. He believes that this world is not superintended or governed by uh, a higher benevolent power. Because I think the teachings of Christianity are immoral. The central one is the most immoral of all. That is the one of vicarious redemption. You can throw your sins onto somebody else. And I represent an alien worldview world to his. If it isn't objectively true at the bottom, then to hell with it. By what right, Rabbi, do you say that you know God better than they do? That your God is better than theirs? That you have an access that I can't claim to have? There's no such thing as a standardless worldview. Every worldview has standards express or implied, and you can't function without appealing to those standards constantly. I want to base everything on the Bible. And you could, if you were to say, why do you do that? And I said, well, as it says here in Romans, right? You say, wait, 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 I'm challenging, I'm, I'm challenging your authority. You can't just flip to a verse, right? Because you, you're, you'd say, I'm begging the question, reasoning, reasoning in a circle. Well, I would say the same thing here. If a person says, I want to base everything, my whole worldview on reason, and I would say, why do you want to do, why do you do that? When he turns to give me a reason, what's he doing? He's flipping open his Bible. B basically, a debate like this is more, uh, more a collision of lives than it is a, uh, an exchange of mere views. G.K. Chesterton, the great writer of the 19th century, early 20th century, said that the purpose of an open mind is the same as a, uh, the purpose for an open mouth. It's, it's meant to close on something. And an open mind, in pursuit of the truth, is seeking the truth, and, and it needs to close on it so that you're not perpetually open. If you're perpetually open, then, you're, then it's a self-defeating endeavor. Part of the problem is to say that I don't believe that we have arrived at ultimate truth, which is, of course, true. We can provisionally arrive at certain truths that we can know. So, for example, if you, uh, if you say, I believe in an honest and scholarly pursuit of truth, well, that is, that is itself a truth, right? How do you, how do you know that you're, you're supposed to be honest and scholarly in, in pursuit of truth? Well, that's a truth. So there's a, there's a series of layered truths or hierarchical truths that you have to um, sort out in order to have a coherent epistemology, which is the branch of philosophy that addresses how do we know what we know? Well, you might not know what's going on on the other side of Jupiter, but you, you should know the truth about how to go about discovering it in the scientific method, and the same thing is true in history and theology and other things. You have to know certain things. You have to close on certain things. You have to stand somewhere in order to get anywhere. Let's get one thing straight, one thing clear. We've got the flows and you've got the ears. It's a perfect match, and ain't no need to ask nobody. Now let's get one thing straight and one thing clear. We've got the flows and you've got the ears. It's a who wants to be on the left? Who wants to be on the right? Silly question. I'll trust you for it. Uh, yeah. Ecclesiastes says the wise man's heart inclines to the right. <laughs> I forget whether it beats to the left or the right, I can't remember. Please, you say the, the right facing you on this? <laughs> Over this way, down. Um, let's say that the consensus is that our species, we being the higher primates, um, Homo sapiens, have been, has been on the planet for at least 100,000 years, maybe, maybe more. Uh, Francis Collins says maybe 100,000, Richard Dawkins thinks maybe a quarter of a million. I'll take 100,000. In order to be Christian, you have to believe that for 98,000 years, our species suffered and died, most of its children dying in childbirth, most other people having a life expectancy of about 25, dying of their teeth, 
famine, struggle, bitterness, war, suffering, misery, all of that. For 98,000 years, heaven watches it with complete indifference. And then 2,000 years ago, he thinks, that's enough of that. We should, it's time to intervene. The best way to do this would be by condemning someone to a human sacrifice somewhere in the less literate parts of the Middle East. Not, don't let's appear to the Chinese, for example, where people can read and study evidence and have a civilization. Let's go to the desert and have another revelation there. This is nonsense. You, it, it can't be believed by a thinking person. Why am I glad this is the case, to get to the, uh, the point of um, the, the wrongness in the other sense of Christianity? Because I think the teachings of Christianity are immoral. Uh, the central one is the most immoral of all. That is the one of vicarious redemption. You can throw your sins onto somebody else. Vulgarly known as scapegoating, in, in fact, or originating as scapegoating in, in, the, in, the, in the same area, in the same desert. Um, I can pay your debt if I love you. Um, I can serve your term in prison if I love you very much. I can volunteer to do that. I can't take your sins away because I can't abolish your responsibility and I shouldn't offer to do so. Your responsibility has to stay with you. There's no vicarious redemption. There very probably, in fact, is no redemption at all. Um, it's just a part of, uh, of wish thinking, and I don't think wish thinking is good for people either. Um, it, it even manages to pollute the central question, the word I just employed, the most important word of all, the word love, by making love compulsory, by saying you must love. You must love your neighbor as yourself, something you can't actually do, but you'll always fall short, so you can always be found guilty. Uh, by saying you must love someone who you also must fear, that's to say a supreme being, a, an eternal father someone of whom you must be afraid, but you must love him too. If you fail in this duty, you're again a wretched sinner. This is not mentally or morally or intellectually healthy. And that brings me to the final objection. I'll, I'll, I'll condense it, um, Dr. Olasky, um, which is this is a totalitarian system. Um, if there was a God who could do in, of these things and demand these things of us, and who was eternal and unchanging, we would be living under a dictatorship from which there was no appeal and one that could never change, and one that knows our thoughts and can con convict us of thought crime and condemn us to eternal punishment for actions that we are condemned in advance to be taking. Um, all, all this in the round, and I could say more, um, it's an excellent thing that there's absolutely no reason to believe any of it to be true. My religious um, education and early confrontations took place at um, boarding school. Not only were we compelled to attend divine service and to study the scriptures, but also, in some, at least in the second school, so in some ways encouraged to, dis to debate the, the principle. And I realized that it was an argument that I, I enjoyed having and, and also thought was important. Um, you notice that he's not critiquing the Christian faith by appealing to a standard that overarches all human beings and that is, um, that is obligatory for all of us. When he says things like substitutionary atonement is immoral, well, by what standard? Who says? What, what do you mean immoral? What, uh, what worldview considers it to be immoral and why is that worldview in charge of the Christian worldview? Um, all ultimate truth cl claims are, to use uh, postmodern jargon, totalizing. You can't talk about everything without talking about everything. And what Christopher has to do in order to critique the Christian faith is he has to borrow ethical standards from the Christian faith and run a reductio where he says, uh, you, according to the standards that you adopt as Christians, here, let me climb into that. I, let me climb into the Christian car and see if I can drive it into a tree. That, that's what he's doing. Um, but he doesn't have any car to drive of his own. Right? What, why? Um, substitutionary atonement is immoral. How come? Who says? Very well. Let me rush to seize the outstretched uh, paw there. I haven't known, uh, haven't known uh, Douglas Wilson for very long, but he does strike me as a very sweet and decent and generous and humane person, and th thus he obviously doesn't know how insulting, how rude he's just been. Um, <laughs> Not just to me, not just to me, not just to your humble servant, the carjacker, but to you, uh, <laughs> you also, ladies and gentlemen. I, th I think it's a fantastically rude thing to say that if, I, if it wasn't for Christianity, I and you wouldn't know right from wrong. It's an extraordinary thing to say. The, the, the awareness of the difference between right and wrong is innate in human beings, and it can be, and it can be found and noticed, being observed and enforced and upheld um, in societies where Christianity has never yet penetrated. Um, to say that no one, um, let me give an example from the Old Testament. 
the story, as you know, of the wandering in, in the Sinai and the wandering in the desert and so is, is all made up. It's a, it's a Jewish foundational myth. But the Ten Commandments, um, four or five of which do actually contain moral injunctions. Some of them are nonsensical, some of them are theocratic, some of them are self-contradictory. But the ones that say, on the whole, avoid murder, theft, and perjury are, I would consider, sound. And I dare say everyone in this room would without necessarily having to be told. Are we to assume that my mother's ancestors, the ancient Jewish people, got all the way to Mount Sinai under the impression that murder, murder theft, and perjury were all OK? And only when told from on high, stop with that, suddenly thought, maybe they are such bad ideas after all. Of course not. There couldn't have been a Jewish society or enough Jewish solidarity to get them that far, if they, for one thing, if they all thought these things are fine until God says that, that they are. This is not how um, morality is formed at all. To the contrary, as far as I can tell, religion gets its morality from humans. It's a feedback loop. And then it says, uh, uh, tells them to think of things that aren't sins as if they were. For example, coveting your neighbor's goods, a perfectly healthy thing to do. The ambition of uh, jealousy and emulation that's the necessary spur uh, to innovation and to progress can't, is then described quite ludicrously as a sin, and you're made to feel guilty about it when you shouldn't. The, that's the ir irrational superimposition on ordinary human solidarity and morality that is, that is attempted by all religion, not just Christianity. Well, I had to go to church every day at school because that's a legal obligation in Britain. I had to go to scripture classes as well. That's a legal obligation in Britain. But in the holidays, I don't remember being taken to church on Sunday unless it was for a wedding or a christening or Christmas and Easter, that kind of thing. So I don't remember any religious discussion in our house at all of any kind. My father was um, the son of a very strict uh, Baptist home where I think in his boyhood things on Sunday and indeed the rest of the week were quite bleak and quite no music, no cinema, no smoking, that kind of thing. So I think my father decided that his boys, my brother and I, wouldn't be raised in that way. And so he never attempted to inflict any uh, form of Christianity on us. And I've actually no reason to believe that he was himself a believer. There's, there's two things. One, notice that the core of what Christopher acknowledged, that uh, the ancient Jews um, had a quite healthy and robust respect for certain decencies that are pervasive in all societies, particularly religious societies, means that it must be the case that religion does not poison everything. Um, contrary to the thesis of your recent book. Now, you want to go uh, on... Uh, to the contrary. I say, right. they, I say they, had the, they had those things without being told by God. Right, but then having had them, and when religion came along, religion needs to have poisoned it if religion poisons everything. But the, the point is that if... Um, if they already had them because they're human, not because they're religious, and religious, uh, religion screws everything up, then why didn't it screw up, do not murder, do not lie, do not perjure? Why didn't it mess that up? Um, now, here's the thing that is, I, I want to uh, point something out. Not, uh, I'm, I'm quite willing to be direct with Christopher if I think it calls for it, but I don't, I don't want to be unintentionally rude to him. Um, uh, Oscar Wilde defined a gentleman as someone who never insults someone else accidentally. Um, <laughs> um, notice that Christopher said that, that morality is innate, but notice that that's coming from an evolutionist where everything's up for grabs. In, in an evolutionary worldview, everything's on the table. Uh, all kinds of things are innate that used to be innate in our uh, makeup back before we were human beings, when we were another kind of critter. Uh, there were innate things that that disappeared. So why can't our innate morality evolve right along with the rest of us? The other thing is, and this is very important to note, uh, uh, I did not say that Christopher does not know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong. Uh, if you read his book or uh, read his um, book on God is not great, or if you read virtually anything else he writes, it's very, very clear that he has a very acute sense of uh, right and wrong, up and down, righteousness, unrighteous. Um, he um, <coughs> He would make he would have made a very good Puritan, um, and <laughs> he's got, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and to wrap it up, there's a difference between knowing the difference between good and evil and being able to give an accounting of it. My my challenge is not that he doesn't know right and wrong; he does. But how can you account for it given an evolutionary time and chance universe? 
But there's a danger with uh, what you quote from Chesterton, as there is always in quoting Chesterton. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, there's the mouth may slam shut just slightly too soon. Everyone's seen that happen. With people all hang open just that fraction too long. In other words, people will conclude they found the truth a little early. That those who drew the astrological map of the skies, for example, saying the stars move in accordance with our needs, um, didn't know how many planets there were remaining to be discovered when they drew their zodiac, for example. They, they went off half cocked. Quite true. Um, many people concluded that all you needed was the Bible, um, that the Genesis story was an actual account of creation. Um, and then they had to revise that, had to revisit that, and uh, at great cost to those who felt that they were witnessing what had been for the truth all that time. So you would say that the... the, the I'm done for taking a long view of this. Okay. And, um, an objection I have to religion, in other words, is that it is our first and our worst attempt at making sense of things. It was the first attempt at health care, uh, praying for recovery. Um, it may have worked better than not doing so, but it, uh, it's, it's more um, useful to have a germ theory of disease, I think. Um, it was our first attempt at astronomy, first attempt at philosophy and indeed epistemology. First and worst, it happened when we were very afraid, very ignorant, and when we were terrified by natural order events like earthquakes and floods that are susceptible of a much easier explanation. Um, I try not to do too much homework on people. I try not to over-rehearse with things. I try and keep it spontaneous as far as possible. I try and deny people their illusions. Don't people are entitled to respect for the, any illusions they may have or any sort of conceit they may have about themselves and try and be impartial about that, including one's own, I mean, including examining one's own most uh, cherished ideas. I think the only thing that I know of for a fact that we agree on is a, we have shared appreciation for the fiction of P.G. Woodhouse. He wilted like a salted snail. <laughs> or she looked up at him, her face shining with... Her face shining like the scene of a bus driver's truck. <laughs> <laughs> he writhed like an electric fan. <laughs> Ice formed on the upper slopes of the butler. The lunches of 57 years had caused his upper chest to slip down to the mezzanine floor. <laughs> Bees. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Moths are nested in his wallet and raised large families. <laughs> <laughs> um, he looked like a sheep with a secret sorrow. <laughs> a secret sorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's there's nothing. There is, is not, and there never will be anything to touch him. He's a he's a huge improvement over most of the people I get because he appears to really believe it. There's a lot of hypocrisy, I've found, and, and a lot of doubt and indeed unbelief. This kind of debate, particularly with someone of Christopher's background and quickness and so forth, is not the sort of thing you can cram for. If, if, if you're not ready, if you're not ready, you're not ready. From here to along here, roughly, is result every single word written by George Orwell the entire 20 volumes of the Oxford English Dictionary, the, the sort of final court of appeal. And these are mainly books about politics. So I have a, a pretty good and growing collection of books about faith versus reason. And these are reference books, essentially. Volume books, the Torah, the Quran, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and so forth. If you've thought through these issues for many years, and if you've thought as you've been reading books, Oh, what would I say to that? What would I say to this? What would I say to this other thing? How would, what's the response to that? If you have that turn of mind and you've been doing it for years, then you have what they called copiousness. Uh, something, he'll, he'll say something in the debate and something will occur to you that can be brought against that. It's, it's a, a burdensome assumption that makes it, that, well, in that case, where are all the psychopaths and sociopaths coming from? They're all made in the image of God as well. Sure, I know what assumption why, you why, think why would why, why would God want to do that, make someone innately wicked? There is no way of escaping some kind of confrontation with religion. Because religion is, religion is, is the first attempt by our species to make sense of, of itself as a species and of the cosmos in which it finds itself. The doctrine of creation is the precondition to the doctrine of the fall, which describes man's sin and rebellion against God, and then God's promise of a Messiah. So my, my worldview is the classic Christian worldview. It's the indispensable argument. Do they think that they're here because of the laws of biology? 
random mutation and natural selection uh, constituting evolution, or because of a divine plan uh, for themselves. And I think you can tell a lot about somebody right away from which, which um, view they take. The first reason, the most fundamental reason, the most basic reason I'm a Christian is because my parents were Christians and they loved me and taught me and my mom spanked me diligently and brought me up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. My parents were consistent Christians and they lived out the life of Christ uh, for us as kids. After 9-11 I, I had this sort of vague feeling that I was cheating on my dues if I didn't sign up. Up until then, I'd had a British passport, European Union passport, and a green card. One of those old-fashioned platinum green cards that doesn't run out, doesn't need to be renewed. I felt a sort of solidarity with, with the United States and with its people, uh, but of a kind I hadn't had to feel before. And I also had to see the country and its people being unbelievably abused by Europeans and others um, in the efforts it made to, to uh, respond to Islamic um, fascism, as I call it. I think faith is, if, if it's a virtue at all, and I'm not sure that it is, it's certainly the most overrated of them, maybe one of the deadly virtues. Now, I believe that the uh, defenses for the Christian faith are, are sound and solid, and, I can, and I've studied them and worked through them, and I've embraced them and, and sort of made them mine, but that's not why I am a Christian. I'm a Christian because it was a gift of God. The idea of someone being a person of faith, being necessarily and in and of itself a good thing, uh, needed to be challenged, if not, um, um, if not more than challenged, if not repudiated. Um, because the most, most faith-based people in the United States on September 11, 2001, were undoubtedly the people who hijacked those planes and used humans as weapons to destroy other humans. So really, ever, ever since then, I've, I've got up every day knowing what I'm doing. Douglas, uh, what, is your, what is your basis for truth? Well, as a confessing Christian, I believe that uh, we can't know anything apart from the revelation of God. God reveals himself. God reveals himself in the created order. Uh, as Paul says in Romans 1, he reveals himself in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, his, his son Jesus Christ, and he reveals himself in Scripture. So I believe that taking all those things together and God giving us reason to sort these things out, make sure that we're not um, misunderstanding or twisting, uh, to make sure that our mouth doesn't close too soon, that we don't um, e eat the first thing or eat the wrong thing or that, that sort of thing. You have an open mind. And you have an open mind for a purpose, and that's to feed on the truth. And you don't want to, you don't want to be distracted by false food. Uh, so, but but I believe ultimately we are finite, and we cannot know anything um, without presupposing, uh, as Francis Schaeffer put it, the God who is there, the God who is there, the God who speaks. Another title of Schaeffer's a brilliantly titled book. He is there, and he's not silent. So. I cannot know God, I cannot find God, I cannot discover God, but it doesn't follow from that that God can't find me, or that he can't discover me, or he can't reveal something to me. Paul, in isn't the book it, Romans, me, I just ahead. have to say, yeah. isn't it a little self-contradictory to say that you can't know or find God, which is a statement I would have to agree with, and then say that you know that he's revealed himself. Great, great and you point. Know I was going to ask And you know the name of his son. Because yeah. Paul said yeah. that the, and the, the, the evidence terms. of him is yeah. all around us. Is that not right? You, right. Would, you would hold to that truth, right? The, the God is all around us? Yes, but the fact that God is all around us doesn't mean that I am aware or am prepared to admit to myself okay. that he is. So if I'm chained to a dungeon wall, I can admit my helplessness in that I cannot touch the jailer's nose. It doesn't follow from that that the jailer can't walk up to me and touch mine. Right? My limitations are right. not his limitations. Right. We had an online exchange um, which was received very well, and that turned into the book. He wanted me to let you know that he reads your blog religiously.
So this okay. is this is why there are basic epistemologies. You've got rationalist epistemology in the history of philosophy, um, reason. You've got um, empiricism uh, based on experience, and then you've got revelatory epistemology, which, which is that the ultimate truth has to tell us in order for us to know. Let's continue this you discussion. Just made, by the way, the perfect profession of the Islamic faith. Well, let me let, let's continue. That's a good good place to start uh, with our next segment. We'll look at, look at the goodness or morality, and then. I want to ask these two gentlemen how they came to their station in life. For Christopher, that's unbelief, and for Douglas, that's belief in Christ. We'll be right back. Stay with us. I have to say, I mean, one can't always say this. <coughs> I mean, our very first exchange, the one about the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, the, the, the Jericho Road story, I was exposed to an argument that was, for me, for the first time, that this is not just a parable of, um, of, a, of, a, of a parable in the sense of being a morality tale, uh, but was intended by its narrator to make people think again about the despised Samaritan minority. Whoever his motives were for acting in this, let's call it altruistic, or anyway, very humanitarian way, it can't have been Christianity because it's Jesus telling the story. So it's something that happened before Christianity. It could have been his motivation for good behavior. So that in one way, the story subverts itself. Of course, the people who behave worse or are most indifferent to the sufferings of the, the luckless man who's um, taken by thieves on the Jericho Road are, are the priests and the Levites, the religious officials. Jesus told the story deliberately because the Samaritans were despised half-breeds. And so it was as though Jesus were telling the story in 1950s Birmingham, Alabama, where the one good guy was the black man who stopped to help the white guy, and the white preacher and the white deacon and the white everything just passed on by. So the ethnicity of the Samaritan was important at, at that level because Jesus was taking a shot at the ethnocentric, uh, God belongs to us attitude of the, of the generation that he was in. It was not, never taught to me as an example of anything more than be nice to people. Yeah. That's because, incidentally, there's an invariable tendency in Sunday school lessons to veer toward moralism. Yes, what, what, can, what can we do to make good little boys and girls good little boys? And so many of the parables are missed. And Jesus was telling these radical inflammatory parables about the judgment that was coming on Jerusalem. And the, the parable of the vineyard, obedient, disobedient sons, the prodigal son. Uh, the prodigal son is all about Israel. Israel going off to a far country. Israel in exile. And so he's telling these uh, prophetic stories that are except that he would except that he was willing to eat swine food yes right. i'm not sure how, how is really that is well, well that's that's the point that, that was yes. the point is that you all have become corrupted you all are you think you're in the holy land but it's really babylon it's really um, i remember it from the king james version says and he fain he fain would fill his belly with the husk the swine to eat yes gives you an idea of falling on hard times that's that's the definition. That's a recession. That's a recession. <laughs> That's a recession. <laughs> I, I don't normally do this. I thought, all right, you know, we're off to the races in a way. Because it isn't very often um, in debates, I think, that people do hear an argument they haven't heard before. Dirty apes in the mix. Welcome to that MVP, dirty slap ish. If you want to be awe-inspired, ladies and gentlemen, 
And let me say, let me just tell you that those of us who do not believe we are divinely created, let alone divinely supervised, are not immune to the idea of awe and beauty and, uh, and the, the transcendent. Let me invite you to look for a moment at the pictures taken by the Hubble telescope. Some of you may have done it. If you haven't done it now, or yet, do it soon. The extraordinary revelations of, 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 of swirling, yet somehow beautiful new galaxies uh, in, in color and depth and majesty like nothing I think the human eye has ever seen. Turn away from that if you wish and, say, and gaze at a burning bush in, a, in an illiterate desert part of the Middle East and say that that's where revelation comes from. I don't believe you'll be able to do it. Or read a page of, the, of Stephen Hawking on the absolute magnificence and, and consistency and underlying beauty. As Einstein says, the great miracle of, of physics is there are no miracles. It all, it all carries on holding together all the time. There are no interruptions in its order. There are no suspensions of it just to please Joshua or just to please uh, some sect or tribe or group. No, it's much, much, much more impressive than that. Hawking has a colleague who looked at the event horizon of the black hole. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know what a black hole is at any rate. If you could travel towards a black hole, not yet possible to do, if you could, in theory, the event horizon is the point at which the black hole is pulling everything into itself. So over into the black hole goes light itself. It's so strong it can pull light back into itself. It's really awe-inspiring. A lot more say than a crowd of pigs infested by devils running down a hill into the sea, which is a piece of sorcery and cheap magic of the sort that shouldn't impress any thinking person. Think about a black hole instead. Pulling the light into itself, the event horizon just reorganizing nature. So that if you could get to that lip, the lip of that event horizon, and fall in and go in, you could in theory see the past and the future stretching before and in front of you. You would see time, except you wouldn't have the time to do it, of course, if you were a mere, if you were a mere primate as we are. But Hawking has a colleague who says if he knew he was dying of a terminal, Ill of terminal illness, that's how he'd want to go out, is over the lip of the event horizon. That would be majesty. That would be magnificence. That would be awe-inspiring. That would be apocalyptic. So it's in the natural world, it's in the world of science and the world of innovation and discovery and doubt, we wouldn't have discovered any of these things if we'd taken the religious story granted, for granted to begin with. We would have said we already know enough. We know. God made this. God wants it this way. What's the need for inquiry? We already have all the information we need. When you think about uh, crossing over the event horizon into a black hole and you get to the point where you see the future and the past at the same time, or you think about quantum mechanics and things uh, uh, traveling like a uh, particle and arriving like a wave or vice versa or the same thing, you know, they're both at the same time, that sort of thing. The thing that astonishes me when I, when I read um, physicists, particularly atheistic um, uh, fellows who are of evoking a sense of wonder out of their descriptions of these sorts of things, and you heard Christopher just do it, they then turn around and say that they have objections to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity because they can't make sense of it. Does it make sense to you that you could see the past and the future at the same time, provided you were headed toward a big black hole of nothing? <laughs> Would you sketch that for me on the blackboard, please? Well, of course, it, it could, that could be done. The Trinity can't be done in that way. Ah, sure. I'd triangle in a circle. <laughs> so, it, the, 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 the point... How do you do it? <laughs> there are mysteries beyond us, right? The, 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 the issue is not whether there are things in the universe that will stagger us and make us go, whoa. Uh, the issue is... When you reflect on what you think is actually going on, when you, think, when you reflect on what is actually going on, and you say there's no purpose in this, there's no design behind it, it's just a plain, weird, crazy place, I believe that you have um, uh, taken, uh, removed the aesthetic 
element. You've removed the element of intention. It may be big, it may be, it may be crazy, it may be wild, it may be chaotic, but it's not lovely. But if it is designed by God, in other words, if all those galaxies that you can see through the Hubble pictures, if all those galaxies, if, if the Crab Nebula and, and all of those things were put there on purpose by the triune God of Scripture, then you have not only something that's grand and big in scope, but you have intentionality. You have what I would call artistry. God is a great artist. There's a term of art in your community. Uh, that I've been picking up on tonight. Noetic. Yes. Not term used outside your right. Correct. It's um, actually comes from uh, the Reformed tradition, and it's uh, the Greek word "nous" for mind. So, uh, and, and it refers to the intellectual impact of sin. So the fact that we're sinners, Aquinas, Aquinas thought that our reason was unfallen, but our bodies were fallen. So on. In the Calvinist tradition, the doctrine of total depravity does not mean absolute depravity, but it means that sin gets into everything, including your thought processes. Yes. Um, so the, the intellect is fallen as well as the flesh. You, you said if there is no God there, we might have to abolish slavery by ourselves, right? And here's my question. Why wouldn't you say we would have to abolish slavery ourselves or not? Or, well, it, well, as no one here doesn't know, there are biblical mandates for killing, and indeed for the killing of nations, and for the killing of tribal groups, and for the killing of all their children so that their name be blotted out, and for, in the case of some luckier groups than the Amalekites, uh, keeping only their young women alive uh, so that, um, well, for, for, I think for purposes better imagined than described. But when you go into the marketplace of ideas, there are worldviews that are irrational. What is the sound of one hand clapping? The whole idea is to get your mind to trip off the line. Yes. There are other worldviews that are reason-based, and you're out in the marketplace of ideas. At some point, you have to choose between those options. And you can't use the criteria for justification within one of those options to justify that initial choice. That's my point. I believe that it was okay to kill Amalekites. Right? Because it was not okay to not do it because God told them to kill the Amalekites. Uh, we would differ well, on... Well, there you are. I've got you to say it. Okay. Well, happy to say it. And didn't get me to say it. No, I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know you get a bang out of saying it. <laughs> no. what, I, what I actually get a bang out of is what I'm going to get you to say next. Uh, and that is, um, neither one of us has a problem with killing Amalekites. I don't have a problem with it because God told him to do it. You don't have a problem with it because the universe just doesn't care what happens to Amalekites. No, actually, that's not true because uh, what if I was an Amalekite? Well, the, that, you're not the universe. Well, no, I'm sorry, it still changes everything. No, 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 uh, no it doesn't. Because you're not an Amalekite, they're all dead. They're all dead. That is what relativism means. Good. And when you look at Freud's projection theory that we, we have a need for a father and we project a divine father up into the yeah. sky, that's one accounting, but there's also the other accounting of, of atheism as fatherlessness, where you have the opposite thing going on, where you, where, as C.S. Lewis said when he lost his faith in Surprised by Joy, he was an atheist for a time and he was believed that there was no God and he was very angry with him for not existing. Yes, sir. Right. Um, and I've met, I've met atheists like that. They're very, very upset with dad for going away. Um, Right, and I have a hard time not seeing that as as much of a projection as the person who wants a Santa Claus in the sky to comfort them when they got a, an owie. Um, it, it was argued by some of the early church fathers, Marcion, I think, was the best known, that Christianity should, should begin again. That it should be the it should be a, a religion of the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, and it, it shouldn't be the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. It shouldn't take on the appalling burden. Of, of all the mad, uh, genocidal, Stone Age Jewish books that preceded it. it. It could begin again. Unfortunately, Marcion lost this argument, so Christianity takes on this appalling burden uh, with which it saddled itself forever, which is the reason why it will never become a universal or redemptive religion, among many other reasons. I believe there are Christians who project 
wish fulfillment desires. Yes. But wish fulfillment works both ways. You know the difference between Freud and Nietzsche? Yes. <laughs> Nietzsche says God is dead, Freud says God is dead. <laughs> As to the resurrection, I'll only add this as an amateur on these, on these matters. There are a huge number of resurrections mentioned in the New Testament. Just in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, there's the raising of Lazarus and of the daughter of Jairus, neither of whom ever say a word, nothing is ever said about what was it like, what did they say, how was it, how was it to be dead? Questions that you'd think even the most incurious villager would want to ask them. They're just raised from the dead and we move on. There's nothing said about it. I think rather astonishing, but making it seem as if resurrection is a relative commonplace in the sense. Then, in the Gospel of, I'm pretty sure it's Matthew, and I know I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, at the time of the crucifixion, I almost can quote the verse directly, the graves of, of Jerusalem opened as the heavens darkened and as the veil was torn. And those who were lying in those graves left them and walked around the markets and streets of Jerusalem and were greeted by many who they knew. What's wrong with this story? It means resurrection is a relative commonplace. Uh, it means there isn't anything specifically wonderful about it. It means the sort of thing you might expect any time to meet a former dead friend or relative of yours wandering the streets in their seerments and grave clothes. So the Mesotheist or the Antitheist position the one I take is that not that you're cross with someone who you don't believe in, but that you would be very upset if it were true. Right, but would, you, you would be frightened at the thought that there was a, a, a tyrannical dad you couldn't shake. Sure. You would never die and get out of your way. Sure, but if you to be upset with him, if he were there, to be upset with him, you'd have to borrow standards from him in order to be upset with him. Final point is this. If someone is born of a virgin, it doesn't prove to me that anything they say is true. Someone may say in the middle of an argument with me, you lose. I say, why is that? Because my mother never went to bed with any man. I say, wait a minute, you haven't proved your argument is better at all by saying that. It doesn't prove you're a better person. It doesn't prove that God is your father. It doesn't prove anything. I may grant that your mother was a virgin. Parthenogenesis is actually a remote possibility, but you would prove nothing by proving it of yourself. And if you say that um, you win the argument because you were once dead and now you're alive, I will look at you slightly narrowly. If I was on the bus with you, it's odd, isn't it? If you were on the bus next to someone who said, you know, I used to be a dead person, but I'm alive now. <laughs> you would move towards them or away? Everybody knows what they would do. Provided they, they were If they said they were hearing voices from God telling them what to do, I think the reaction is the same. Taxi! So the point is that if you postulate a belief in God and say, and I would be very angry with him for doing what he's doing, were he there? Yes. Okay, the problem is, were he there, there's a good explanation for what he's doing, consistent with his nature and character. Right, so if I step, I can't, I, I can't step into that world and just take part of the world. If I step into that world and say, um, God has God is created all this mess and he's a nin nincompoop, or a demon or something, or an ogre, I haven't fully stepped into that world. As soon as I fully step into the world, God controls everything, he controls evil, he's sovereign over evil, the god of Calvinism, and there's a good reason where all things are going to come out and be uh, clear at the end. The stranger on the bus is a stranger on the bus. However, if you traveled around with a guy for three years, he told you he's going to come back from the dead, and he did. I, I hope you would look at him more than just squinty-eyed. So, so when, when I uh, conclude that there's a God, then I say, all right, what are the moral implications? What, what are the ethical implications of God not caring? They could be terrified. Correct. Um, Lazarus was a resuscitation. Lazarus died again. Jesus was raised from the dead, never to die again. The resuscitations that Jesus accomplished and that Peter did and, and happened in the Old Testament, resuscitations occurred, yes. But Jesus was the first person in history to come back from the dead, never to die again. And to so say he would reappear in the lifetime of his disciples? No. Yes. No, he said he was going to come back and destroy Jerusalem, which he did in 70 AD, right on the money. <laughs> It was the Roman Empire didn't do this. No, it was the, he said this, gener this generation will not pass away until all these things will, are fulfilled. Oh. The sun, the, the, the moon, hang on a second. <laughs> this is really important, actually. I know it is, yeah. 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 In, 
When Jesus, when Jesus says in Matthew 24, the, moon's, the sun's going to go out and the stars fall from the heavens, he's quoting from Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 34. Um, there's decreation language throughout the Old Testament. Every time it occurs in the Old Testament, it always refers to a dis military destruction of a nation or a city-state, always. In Isaiah 13, an oracle against the king of Babylon, and then you have the same decreation language. Then Jesus says in Matthew 24, not one stone's going to be left on another. The disciples say, when is it going to happen? Jesus quotes Isaiah. So Jesus is not talking about the end of the space-time universe. He simply isn't. It has nothing whatever to do with that. It has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened within one generation, just as Jesus said, authenticating have, him as a prophet. Don't you have an abnormally unsuspicious mind? <laughs> if, you, if you see someone saying, if I'm saying this so the prophecies can be fulfilled, he knows what the prophecies are. Mm -hmm. And he says, the prophecies say, if the Redeemer comes to Jerusalem, he'll come riding a donkey. Where's my donkey? Let me straddle the donkey and come in, and it's Passover time. Sure. And it says in the books themselves, it says, and this was done so that the prophecies might be fulfilled. So it's a self-conscious engineering I'll give you of, the, the, of what would be laughable to call I'll, predictive. I'll, I'll give you the donkey. The donkey could have been arranged. The, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what I was talking about... Donkeys is, can always be arranged. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was talking about... The Asses can be arranged. I, could, I was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which was not arranged that way. So when Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, my central point is you interpreted him as predicting the end of the space-time continuum. He wasn't talking about that at all. He was predicting the end of the Judaic Aeon, the temple sacrifices, and Jerusalem, and he did not arrange for the Romans to come in and do that. I think the, the concept of, the, of a personal devil is much more um, intertwined with the nature of human beings. And it's different from the Antichrist. Yes, yeah, oh yes, yes. The Antichrist is just a false teacher in the church. I think his name was Serinthus. In fact, a, a false... Um, the Antichrist is not the the uh, person at the end of the history of the world. The Antichrist is the one who denies that Jesus is God come in the flesh. And there was a Gnostic teacher named Serinthus in Ephesus. That I think John was talking about him when he uses the phrase Antichrist. And he, because he denied the incarnation. And um, that's a, so I think Serinthus was the Antichrist. The beast was Nero. So the, uh, there's a dispensationalist have popularly confounded the beast and the Antichrist yeah. as this end of the world figure. But if you want a modern, a modern beast would be someone like Stalin, a civil ruler who perse persecutes the church. A modern Antichrist would be a liberal Methodist bishop who denied... <laughs> Jerry Falwell said he's, a, he's, he's here now. How do you show that Falwell was wrong? Once you assume there is such a thing, how, how, how do you show Falwell hasn't guessed better than you? It's not guesswork, it's exegetical. So it, where does the Bible use the word phrase Antichrist? In 1 John and 2 John, that's the only place. Yeah. The book of Revelation doesn't have the word Antichrist in it. It has the word beast in it. So the whole concern is the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the, the beast with seven heads, the seven heads are seven hills. Rome was the seven-hilled city, famous for it. The seven heads began with Julius Augustus, uh, you know, all the way through down to Nero. Oh, you're not a liberation theologian. I'm not even close. <laughs> no, not, even, not even close. In our travels and our exchanges, Christopher, Christopher and I have differed on this, where uh, Christopher sees God, if he were he to exist, as a big, big brother, Orwellian, um, an, the ultimate Orwellian tyrant. I see God as a father, and I, I can certainly live with um, a condition of big brotherlessness, but I can't live with the condition of fatherlessness. Um, and and how you assume you'll never grow up then. You have to lose your father in order to grow up. This yeah. one will never quit on you. He'll yeah. never make room. He, yeah. all, he's always there. Yeah. You're yeah. always a child. Yeah, he's always there. Who, would, a, who wants this? Who would like this to be true? It's a horrible idea. Me, I'd like it to be true. Well, and well, part of the re part of the reason uh, for that is I'm. 55. I've grown up, my, but my earthly father, my physical father, is still there. He's still my father, and I still honor him, and that's, what, that's one of the reasons why in the Ten Commandments it's so important to honor your father. Christopher, let me run something by you. That I, um, I'm going to try this another way, because I think this is a point that came up in our book, and I don't, I don't think I'm making myself clear on this. Let's say there's a pagan guy who's the jolliest guy in the world, naturally selfless, 
good digestion, pops up at five in the morning every morning to help people. Yes. You know, he's just that kind. Of, he's just that kind of guy. One of those Vikings who <laughs> doesn't get into history books. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's, uh, the stories weed them out. Yeah, I'm with you yeah. now. <laughs> <clears throat> then let's say there's right living right next door to him is Mrs. Grundy, who is a Christian, Orthodox, mm -hmm. um, dour, prunish, crabby, yells at all the neighborhood kids. Yeah, yeah. Just an irritating uh, I'm with you. pain in the you-know-what. Uh, and then has Bible verses to justify out of what she's doing. And let's say the non-Christian's an atheist, and he's just jolly, right? Um, that's the, those are the, and they live right next door to each other, and all the kids in the neighborhood like the atheist and they dislike Mrs. Grundy. That, those are the facts on the ground. Well, it's happened a lot. Yeah, and, yes, I agree. And, and so our discussion about morality doesn't have to do with that, whether that happens. Um, if, if the question is, can Christians behave in outrageous ways? Oh, no, no, it wasn't that at all. It was the idea that the, the knowledge of right and wrong, good from evil, the distinction, isn't available to us except by Right, right. No, That's it's not, all. It's not the knowledge. But it isn't, it isn't part of our, it isn't part of our moral integrity and property. Individual human beings are not discrete, standalone units like so many marbles in a box. There's true individuality, but we're more like leaves on a tree. We're all connected. So it's not possible for someone to declare independence from. Uh, from the human race. You can't say, I am I am my own reasoning unit. I'm out here all by myself, and I will come to truth as I see it. And think that something that explains everything doesn't explain very much. That's the notorious disadvantage of it. I like to give blood, for example. I positively enjoy doing it. Um, <laughs> if I said, it gives me pleasure because it puts me in well with my lord and supreme celestial dictator, I think you might think less of me perhaps, than you, I was about to say, than you already do, um, than, you would, <laughs> than you would if I just left it where I just left it. Now do you see? I don't see how anybody can say that there was no fundamental transformation of constitutional understanding, mm. federalism, all of that. Lincoln decided that the way to, as it were, heal the national wounds was to consider matters as an extension of 1776, as a reaffirmation of the Declaration. As he says, Four score and seven years ago, our forefathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. Well, of course, they did nothing of the kind. If you read uh, the Federalist Papers, one of the things they fall all over themselves in the constitutional arrangement saying is that this is not a nation. This is a, a union of states with a constitution. We are not a nation. We are not a nation. We are not a nation. The idea of a republic, um, that's the word to get around it with. Because the Republic just means a thing, our thing. There's a sort of harmonic convergence, if you like. Christopher describes himself not so much as an atheist, but as an anti-theist. Douglas Wilson is a Christian. The reason I'm a Christian, to be frank and honest, is I was brought up by Christians, by consistent, godly Christians. You would agree that murder is evil? I wonder what kind of book buyers they are. These are the sort of people who buy the Left Behind series, aren't they? Which means they can't be reading for pleasure or instruction. Christopher, is there a basis for goodness or morality in the world? For yes, you? I, I think so, yes. What would that be? Human solidarity. The brotherhood of man, if you want to call it that. Some people say the brotherhood of man depends on the father of God. How do you explain countries like Norway, Sweden, Finland, or Denmark that are majority atheists, agnostics, or non-believing, but are among the most morally healthy countries in the world? 
Well, that's a great, great question. The prodigal son didn't run out of money the first day away from home. So when the, when the checks started to bounce, they started to bounce later. Growth of man exists whether there's God or not. Partly it's an evolutionary necessity. I don't want to reduce it to just animal status, but other species have it too. They look out for each other, they form family ties, they, they understand that they have a common interest. All you have to do is get a, uh, get a map of the world out and look at where Christianity has gone, where it has been entrenched, where it has been established, and look at what nations you're looking at. You're looking at the nations of the first world. That, there's no mystery about any of this. It's not a, it's not a, a struggle that begins with the fruit of knowledge in a, in, a, in a mythical garden. It's the result of being an evolved primate mammalian species. Protestants are hustlers. Yeah. And so unfortunately, some of them in the negative sense of that term. We've never yet found a human society where murder, theft, and perjury are admired, or where uh, courage and self-sacrifice are despised. They came to do good and they ended up doing well. <laughs> Cotton Mather said, faithfulness begat prosperity, and the daughter devoured the mother. Did he say that? Interesting. So yes, there, are, there have been societies where murder is approved, pr provided that the victims have a certain skin color, or be, belong to a certain Well, the Old Testament race. mandates that. The Old Testament says that the children of Israel are, are, are commanded to exterminate yeah. the Amalekites unto the very last one. And so the problem... Except the ones they keep for yeah. rape and slavery. Rulers and managers of societies generally like religion, and it doesn't matter which one, uh, because they want, they want to utilize it as a form of social control, uh, reinforcing certain behaviors that are good for the society and discouraging others and so on. The problem with basing your morality on human solidarity is you can't say humans have this solidarity except when they don't. I mean, what yes, do you mean? But yes, how you, certainly can. you can say that, but how, what, why are you picking such morality as we do have? I say it's a name. As are the, the things we don't think of as so attractive. Sure. What's, what's so complicated about this? How do you choose between them? If if the authoritative nature of the morality comes from it, 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 this innate status, what about our innate predisposition to go to war? or to commit genocide. Well, as with things like incest and cannibalism, if, if they're widely practiced or if they're not properly suppressed and condemned, it'll take care of itself. The society that does it will, will collapse, will cease to be. The society that exterminates its enemies? No, society, no that, that they will not because of the, uh, or they won't always. But that's why it's mysterious to me that there's a biblical injunction to exterminate other people. Let's continue this discussion in a moment. We'll be right back. Well, I think it's clear, clear. it's as evident as the pike, plain as the pike staff that your sense of morality is not a put on or a show. You believe and instinctively apply and feel certain things. What I'm, what I'm saying is that when I ask, okay, you're, let's postulate two more people, a jolly Christian yes. and a dour, evil, you know, atheist, the word, you know, the, sure. all right? Now we've got four people. Now the point is, which two people in that lineup of four are being the most inconsistent with their premises. Who's rebelling against their premises? Who's rebelling against what they say they believe the most? And I would say it's the dour, crabby Christian who's in high defiance against what she says she believes. And if someone were to say, and the evil, the evil atheist guy, he's inconsistent too. I'd say, no, no. I, I agree that he's doing things that Christopher would He's do. not inconsistent with atheism, man. Exactly. That's my, that's my point. The nation's capital. You're a wonderful writer. Thank that's you. very kind of you to say. Wow, Thank you. Very kind of you to write. Gosh. First today. We're going to Martin's Tavern in Georgetown where the young senator JFK used to go for his breakfast. Yeah, that's good. Just keep charging along here as rapidly as we can. Why do I not think that Christianity is good for the world? We have come, ladies and gentlemen, to this. Don't tell me that by adding the word religion, to the argument that you say that abolishes relativism. Religious morality is just as relative 
just the subject to evolution. Grow, I mean it, I mean it, Douglas, grow up. You have to. By what standard do you condemn any action? I tell you how I make up my mind on things. I look at the evidence as well as I can. I try and find out as much of it as I can. I, really can. I make allowance for my own, what I wish would be the case. And I try and discount for it. And then I come, try and come to a conclusion. Have you not noticed that religious preachments that used to be absolute um, have evolved too? The church used to say, if you sin, you will go to hell. You'll, you'll burn forever. Or the Catholic Church used to say until recently, if, you, if your child isn't baptized, we won't say hell, but we will say limbo. And now they say, actually, you're not so sure about that. What is your basis for morality? Well, I, I believe that the basis for morality is the nature and character of God, the way God is, and he reveals uh, what that means in day-to-day -day, um, issues and transactions by means of scripture, by means of his law. So the law is not simply an arbitrary list of rules, it's more a description of what God's like. Uh, he's, he's love and you, love does no harm to his neighbor. Um, and so that's the connection that Paul makes in Romans, uh, Romans 13. So. I, I, I believe that we have to ground morality in the nature and character of God as he reveals it to us. The problem with grounding it in innate instinct, um, like human solidarity, is that we have competing, jostling instincts. And I, if I have instinct A that is bubbling up from within the human race and instinct not A, a contrary impulse, you've got the impulse to help your neighbor and to be a nice guy and get along, and then you've got the impulse to go to war and exterminate people you don't like. I can't have a, th I can't introduce a third instinct, a third innate instinct that tells me how to, how to pick between those two. I, I, I just don't have the authority. It's, it's like lifting, lifting yourself up by your own coat collar. You see a woman thrown to the ground in the street by a man or two men and kicked hard in the stomach, kicked in the uterus. What is your instant reaction? Is it one of revulsion or not? <coughs> Who's going to say they're indifferent? You're perfectly welcome to do so if you like. Do you need divine permission for this? I would say not. I had another question. The woman is visibly pregnant. Does that make it seem more revolting to you? Is your revulsion but thereby increased? Who would not say yes to that? Planned Parenthood. What? what? Who would not say yes to that? Planned Parenthood. No, don't be flippant. I'm not being no, flippant. Well, don't be flippant. If it's, a, if it's a common moral property, then why, when you see a woman being kicked in that fashion, to be more consistent, and this is why I was emphatically not being flippant, people would run up and say to the kicker, do you have a license? Don't, don't you know the place for that is down the street? And, and you have to advertise in the yellow pages? And you have to get funding from Congress? What do you mean flippant? Where do you think you got that knowledge? Did you get it from Sunday school? I believe this is, this is our common moral property. That without it, we're lost. But if we say we only owe it, to the, the beneficence of a dictator, we have volunteered to become ourselves. You can be an atheist and you can be a sadomasochist. You can be an atheist and a psychopath. You can be an atheist and be a fascist. To be a communist, you practically have to be an atheist. It doesn't commit you to anything. Uh, but it does certainly not, not commit you to the absurd belief that if you don't have a supernatural belief, you have no morals. If one looks at human history and how human cultures have lived, can't one say that the purpose of morality is to allow us to ameliorate harmful conditions, to allow us to partner with each other, essentially to live together. And that's why every human society has had the same basic rules, no matter what their beliefs about metaphysics. Every finite creature has to start somewhere. All of us have certain fixed axioms, and we reason from those axioms. My axioms are Christian. Your argument to, to uh, Christopher is a pragmatic argument. That's all it is. You're a re resolution of the pragmatic argument is to choose an idea of God that will give you a standard that you can impose on everybody. And I'm saying that standard you're imposing comes from people who I wonder why you've chosen. Um, someone once said, um, if God is one, then what is evil? Right? If, if all is one, if God is one, if everything is one, what is evil? And the person who said that was Charles Manson. Right? So ideas have consequences. John Lennon's Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven above us, all right? No hell below us, all right? Above us, only sky. Above Auschwitz, only sky. Above Buchenwald, only sky. 
there are people in the history of this world who have believed that above them was only sky. Stalin believed that there was no justice in front of him, right? He was on his deathbed, believed no justice was awaiting him. He didn't believe that there was a God to whom he had to give an account for his behavior. Uh, basically, if someone says in the name of Christ that this is what God wants you to do, what Christ says to do, um, I have to know that that's not right in order to be able to answer them. And I can't know it's not right unless I know what is. Don't, don't you think you and I could agree that it would have been better for a lot of people, many millions of people, if Stalin had believed that there was justice ahead of him? There's some religious commandment that says you can kill people in the other tribe. Right. You can kill the Canaanites, the Malachites, whatever. Right, but atheists have no problem with that. There's no problem with that. No, there's, there's no, there, there is a problem. It's absurd. No, sir, only Scott, there's God, absurd. God, there's it's absurd. There's nothing. Look, no, no, the no, religious atheist, atheist may or may not have a problem with Look, that. the universe doesn't care. <laughs> Let me say it again. The universe doesn't care. The thing is that religion and godly societies experience the problem exactly the same way as secular ones do. But referring it upwards to a, to a theocratic dictator is of no help to you. You do think that the sun stood still at midday so Joshua could continue yeah, his I'm, battle. You I'm, did think, say that. Yes. Sir. The laws of physics could be suspended. This, this comes, may come as a shock to some people, but I'm a Christian and I believe what's in the Bible. Who does not have a way of sorting out? But your, your, but your method has to be eeny, meeny, miny, mo. It, you have to, I've got this instinct and that one. The Ten Commandments of which, which appear in two different forms in the same Bible. My question for you is, if there is no loving creator, explain love, explain beauty, explain good. Is there something about him and something about me that makes anyone in this audience think that he or you or anyone else has access to a higher source of authority and information than I do? Is there? You think yes, because you identify. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. Well, there you go. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 are the two places where the Ten Commandments are presented. But, but God's revelation is not made out of two by fours. God doesn't come to us and give us this clunky thing. As I said earlier, God's law reveals his nature and his character. So I don't mind if, if, a, if a parent tells his child to not jump on the couch this way and the next day tells him not to jump on the couch another way. He doesn't have to use the same exact verbal formulation for it to be a, a, a mandatory requirement. I agree with you that referring it upstairs doesn't make us suddenly cease to be sinners. And Christians have sinned, oftentimes grievously, against their own law. You need to have a basis for what you say is right and wrong. Now, Christopher is a very gifted writer. He writes like a, a, an acerbic but witty 10th century archbishop with a bad case of the gout. Are you really telling me you have no answer to my question of a, a moral statement or action that you could do and I couldn't? I've given an answer to that several times. No, no, you haven't. I'll do it again. You have, all you've said is that you think that the commandment to slaughter the Amalekites is a valid one. No, I said... I won't count that because I'm not so actually a Malachite. Christopher, yeah. <laughs> um, Christopher I, I gave you the answer to this in the pub last night in Philly. Um, Here's the, the, the question. If when you have a Christian, what, what moral action could a religious person do, a Christian do, that an atheist could not do? I said that, I told you, the answer is that you're framing the question um, poorly because you have to say, what good Christian could a Christian do that an atheist could also not do consistently with his premises? That's the issue. I'm not debating with you over whether atheists can be good neighbors. No, for instance, though. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, no, I'm not debating with you over whether atheists can do, do good things, whether atheists can affirm the same values that Christians do. I acknowledge that they do. I share many of your values. Many of the things that you reprobate, I also do. I, I, re I enjoy reading a lot of your denunciations because I agree with them. I, just, I think you have a very fine house with no foundation. You don't have, it's just sand under there. I want to know not what you denounce, but why you denounce it. That's what you won't do. Would you be willing to admit that at the end of the day, I'm not talking about personal justice, whether you have a basis for personal justice, I'm not talking about that, but at the end of, of history, that there is any basis for cosmic justice in that scope, or would you be willing to admit, no, in fact, there isn't. There is no rational basis for justice at the end of history. Some people are gonna get screwed, some people are going to have a really good time, and, and though you might, whether you have a reason to or not, fight for justice, uh, there is no ultimate justice at the end of this. Would you be willing to admit that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't think one can avoid the conclusion. Unwelcome though it may be. If there's a designer and a creator and a perfectionist, he isn't perfecting and loving all the time. 
Sometimes he's capricious, sometimes he's inattentive, sometimes he's incompetent, and sometimes he's very cruel. That's the, the minimum you can believe. While we created sick, created diseased, according to Pastor Wilson, created diseased, and then ordered to be good, there was no rebellion against God. And if there was, why would he create us in such a form as to demand that we rebel. The eternal father is the one who just won't quit. He says, I own you. I've got you forever. We'll prevent you from growing up. We'll keep our species in the, the, in the area where I said religion keeps it, in its infancy. It's against freedom. It's against inquiry. It's against science. This is a wicked cult, and it's high time we left it behind. I want you to give me the evidence for an objective moral standard that governs all of us. And you can't appeal to innate, innate anything because those conflict. You can't appeal to the general consensus because those differ over time. You, you haven't given any evidence whatever for all your condemnations of this, that, and the other thing. I can understand. I can understand an atheist saying there is no God. Eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. There is no God, and I'm going to embrace nihilism. I understand that. What I don't understand is the fierce puritanical denunciations of Jerry Falwell and all sort of, you know all the different people who are doing just doing their thing doing what protoplasm does at these temperatures and under these conditions <laughs> right. now why, why the denunciation you know, it's like it's, it's what uh, it's not unlike what uh, the physicist uh, all day said about the universe that it's not just stranger or he put it queerer um, than we understand it's it's stranger queerer than we can understand um, the I, I, I'm happy to uh, that the arguments of ethics and morality and philosophy remain unresolved. See, I don't look for certainty. But you don't act I don't like look for. I don't look for a final <laughs> teleological verdict. I, I know that it will, I will always be arguing. Why is it that the killing, the kicking of a, a pregnant woman in front of me is incredibly repulsive, and yet I could demand the killing no, no. of her and her unborn child in different circumstances? You just said this. this argument will go on, and and probably can't be. Result doesn't mean we have to capitulate the situation or ethics or to what, but I'll it is not improved. It is not improved, let alone solved, by the introduction of a supernatural I'll, authority. I'll, I'll make can't, a deal. The supernatural authority is of no help to us, and it may order us to do things that a secularist would cringe from doing, I'll such as murdering his son to please a uh, Stone Age uh, idol. I'll make you a deal, for example. I'll make you a deal. You say that the, que the basic questions of morality are unresolved. Here's the deal. Why don't you write like they are unresolved? Whoa. Well, I'm, I'm virtually everything you write, you act like, and you and you write. I think many times correctly, you denounce as though they are they are completely and totally resolved. Look, Christopher, there is no God. Shit happens. We began this program with a question, is Christianity good for the world? As we close, let's put that question to our guest. Christopher, let's begin with you. No, I don't think so, partly because I think it's founded on a mythological tribal story that tries to vindicate the wicked propositions of the Jewish Old Testament, which contains, among other things, the warrant for genocide. Second, because it robs us of responsibility. It says that we can, we can throw the responsibility of our sins onto someone else and be be forgiven by finding a scapegoat and making our pain go away. I don't think that's possible, and also don't think it's desirable. I think the concept of vicarious redemption, above all things, is an immoral one. All right, Douglas, <clears throat> how do you answer that question? Is Christianity good for the world? Of course, I, I, of course I believe that Christianity is good for the world, and ultimately I believe it is good for the world because it is the truth of God. If Jesus didn't come back from the dead, we of all men are most to be pitied, as the Apostle Paul says. So I believe it's good for the world necessarily because Christ is the final mankind, the ultimate um, direction of mankind. And uh, in believing the gospel, I certainly believe that. But I'd like to end on this note. I believe that Christianity is good for the world because it has given Christopher a coherent morality with which, with, with which to criticize Christianity. Because without that, without borrowing from the Christian standards, uh, he has no reason to object to the ancient Israelite treatment of the Amalekites, for example. Why would an atheist care? Very interesting. Gentlemen, thank you both for uh, taking part in this debate. Uh, we could go on for another half hour to sure an hour could. for this. Is Christianity Good for the World? Their book uh, is out uh, right now in hardback.
At some point, certainly, we were all asked, well, which is the best argument you've yet come up against from the other side? And I think every one of us picks the fine-tuning one. It's the, the, the most intriguing. The Goldilocks yeah. one. Yeah, okay. The fine, the fine tuning the one degree, well, one degree, one hair different to nothing. But even though it doesn't prove design, doesn't prove a designer, could all have happened without. It, it, you have to spend time thinking about it and working on it. It's not a trivial. We all say that. And then at one point, I think this is not on camera. Um, I said, if um, if I could convert everyone in the world, not convert, if I could convince, to be a non-believer, and I, I'd really done brilliantly, and there was only one left, one more, and then it'd be done. And there'd be no more religion in the world, no more deers, deers. I wouldn't do it. And Dawkins said, what do you mean you wouldn't do it? I said, I don't quite know why I wouldn't do it. And it's not just because there would be nothing left to argue with and no one left to argue with. It's not just that. Though there would be that. Somehow, I, if I could drive it out of the world, I wouldn't. And the incredulity with which he looked at me stays with me still.